afternoon in Richmond Hill, a small community just north of Toronto, and on a skating party with friends, two courting Canadians, Jane and Doug. There they are, striped sweater and sports car cap, respectively. The girl is 18 and the boy is 19. After a day and an evening of parting, they return to Jane's house. It's nice and warm in here. Just a second, I'll tell Mama at home. Okay. Hi, Mom. Oh, hello, dear. Did you have a good time? Mmm, lovely. Stop in Susie's and had a bite to eat and we sort of stayed on for a while. Doug with you? Uh-huh. There's some cake left from dinner. Mm, thanks, but we're just stuck. Okay, dear. Good night. Night, Mom. Night, Dad. Night, dear. She looks even younger than 18. Yes, a very youthful face. She probably won't be much different 20 years from now. Sometimes it must be nice to be married. Really? Jane and Doug have been going steady for five years. Are they a little young for serious courtship? I think. Oh, no. Early marriage is the mode these days. Of course, everything's terribly expensive. Rents are so high, we wouldn't want to live at home. Mr. Weber tells me there's an opening in the bank next September. Do you think you might get it? Oh, I guess I've got a good chance anyway. It's one of those training jobs. I guess I'll try for it. My, they're restrained. Can you imagine our Sicilian Carlo in this situation? <laughs> well, self-discipline is very much the pattern of these days. Playing it cool, I think, is the term. <laughs> It's quite a widespread attitude, but I don't know that it's totally typical of our courting couples. later at the final high school dance. It's the last one for Jane and Doug. Uh, they graduate in the spring. Now, gentlemen, isn't this a little better than peeking at each other across the chaparral? <laughs> I don't think it is. Yeah. Yes, but I think we have to remember that these uh, youngsters aren't as unregulated as they seem. They do create their own rules and their own restrictions, and they have standards of behavior which are expected by themselves as well as uh, the other members of the society. Perhaps not everyone observes the standards, but the majority does, you know, as the majority does everywhere. Excuse me, Spunny. What? I think this is our last school prom. Oh, we can come back next year. That's a grand stick. Well, we want to. See, everybody looks so young to me now. Yeah, they do seem like a bunch of kids, don't they? How much? The starting salary is kind of low. For $2,000. I like an $800 raise in the first year. And I get a regular raise every year after. It's a good future, Jane, if I can make it. Maybe we could manage, Doug. I'm sure we could, what with the money I bring in. They always need girls at the insurance company. We'll only be for a year or two. Well, Doug, if I don't work, then we won't be able to get married. Look, I can save practically all my salary. Mom won't want anything for room and board. We might save enough by next Christmas. It gives us almost a year. We might. The end of next November? Well, I'll leave that to you. Good. Then it's the end of next November, if we get our job. Okay. Well, they're very sweet, but so objective and businesslike. 
yes, but typical of their generation and class. I suppose so. You see, they live in a middle-class, security-conscious society, so they're middle-class, security-conscious people. And they live, as we all do, in a fairly cautious era. There aren't many rebels or adventurers these days. I guess a steady, predictable job in a bank seems very attractive to many young men. You know, I think that could be a bad thing, not only for the young men, but for everyone. Perhaps so, but that's the way it is. What do you think of working wise, Professor? Well, I think it depends on the individual's concern. I am sure, though, that family relationships must change where wise work. Here's something I found incredibly offhand. See what you think. Going out? Yeah. How's the job? Fine. Do you like it? That's okay. Did you get your increase? No, not yet. It's the end of this year. You know, son, in my day, I could have supported the family with what you were in. Well, let's hope I can. Hey, we're getting married, then. Congratulations, son. That's a big step. Thanks, Dad. Bye, Mom. Doug, you and I should have a talk. I can't stop now, Dad. Bye. Goodbye, dear. Give my love to Jane. Did you know we were getting married? No. Did he tell you when? Nobody. Well, I find the boy's casualness quite credible and typical. It might be the individual. Perhaps he's shy with his father. But the fact is that our parents play no vital role in our choice of mate or the decision to marry. Mm -hmm. They may try to influence their children, but they don't necessarily succeed. Ah, now I sense the moment of truth is at hand. You're quite right. When it comes early this year. Maybe it'll end early. Not likely. It usually begins early and ends late. I doubt if Carlo could have done any better, Miss Dodd. Perhaps Doug isn't as restrained as I thought. The first act after the presentation of the ring is to tell Jane's parents. Is this the form, Professor John? Well, I expect the girl wants to tell her parents first. Mm. What's this? Oh, it's real, all right. Look at this. Darling, I'm so happy. When did he give it to you? When's the big day? Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Are you wearing white? Yes, yes. What kind of flowers are you wearing? Oh, roses. Oh. Congratulations, Doug. When's it going to be? Oh, I'd say once a month. Oh, we're glad to have you in the family. <laughs> Thank you very much. You? Jane will decide today. Oh, fine, fine. Well, she'll let us know. Oh, well, not soon enough. Now we're off on a string of parties, including a good many showers for Jane. Is this, uh, is the shower a purely North American custom? Well, perhaps in this form, but the culpable affairs take place in other societies. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a very practical custom. Look at all the loot. Well, in our case, the shower may be a carryover from frontier days, when it was really necessary to give couples practical gifts. Yes, true. Well, possibly a dowry substitute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, rah, rah, rah. Come on, oh, hurry, Doug. Doug. It's almost your last night of freedom. Ah, inevitably the bachelor party. <laughs> yes, as the French Canadians call it, the burial of the bachelor. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> ah, Doug, you're cute. Good old. And now shall we drink a toast to this delight? And finally, the big affair, the engagement party for a horde of friends and relatives. Is this a general practice in Canada? Well, I think it's a, uh, possibly a general practice, but I really don't know. In fact, we don't know much about our own customs. We know a lot about mores and manners elsewhere, but far too little about Canadian ways. Yeah. 
You know, I've often thought that all these incessant parties are much less fun for the guest of honor than they are for the host. Amen to that. I think so, yes. Yeah. Well, at least they can escape a small army of chaperones and slip away together. So, uh, let's leave them quite alone. Well, that was certainly different from the others we've seen. Yes, it was. Uh, First Jones, can we generalize about what we've just seen? Are uh, uh, Jane and Doug typical of most young Canadians? Well, I think they're uh, typical uh, English-speaking, Anglo-Saxon Canadians of their class. But uh, we have um, uh, other large groups in the country, French Canadians, for example, and I think that uh, you would find differences in their patterns, perhaps uh, a few more restrictions. And then there are, of course, uh, other ethnic groups uh, here where traditions uh, from their old country play a part. So, for example, European traditions influencing mm -hmm. the young people. We're, we're really quite a mixed group in Canada, so it's not safe to generalize without uh, a lot of qualifications. Well, we are, but in spite of all this, surely all our young people make their own choice. Uh, our marriages aren't arranged in any way. No, that's true. Uh, romantic love is certainly the basis of courtship, and uh, this does imply free choice on the part of the uh, lovers. Mm. But you've suggested that our free choice is not really as free as it seems, that, that we're subject to convention too. Oh, we certainly are. Uh, mind you, uh, we don't have uh, explicit rules, but there certainly are expectations that are shared by uh, people in the society, and patterns, if you like. Uh, for example, you will find ordinarily that Protestants marry Protestants and Roman Catholics, Roman Catholics, and Jews, Jews, and so on. And we don't approve of uh, interracial marriage. Uh, people do frown on marriages, say, between Negroes uh, and whites. Very true. Uh -huh. And even a large age difference between couples is sometimes frowned upon, mm -hmm. although all of these marriages are very often proven to be some of the most successful. Yeah, they can, they can, they can be successful, if you like, but they're nece not necessarily approved. Yeah. And uh, another thing is we uh, usually find people marrying within their own social class, that, uh, mm -hmm. within the the same kind of social background, if you like. Mm -hmm. So that um, although we don't have formal uh, rules of courtship in the way that some of these societies have, we certainly do have uh, rules. And although families may not play a direct role, uh, certainly the, the group or the society, if you like, uh, controls courtship. Social pressures are very much there. Certainly. Mm -hmm. Well, now we turn to our final courtship uh, and a very traditional society, a village in Kerala in southwest India. I'm looking forward to this one. It's a very lush, fertile part of India. Many rivers leading to the sea, convenient for fishermen and for the movement of people and goods by water. Aside from the fishing grounds, there are heavy stands of palm trees, and the uh, coconut is to this part of India what uh, wheat is to our prairies. This is a village called Kanjirakeri. It's a community of fishermen and farmers and uh, workers in small industry deriving from agriculture and mainly lumber and the products of the coconut. The majority of the people are Hindus, uh, composed of many castes and sects, but there are sizable uh, Muslim and Christian minorities. The workday is drawing to a close in Kanjikari, the last logs being piled in the lumber yards. This is a fairly remote part of India, and uh, modern forms of entertainment and uh, social concourse generally are rare. When he's cut his last coconut for the day, this worker is likely to go to one of the temples and take part in a sort of village concert. A favorite entertainment is the dance of Kathakali, a triangle story of tragic love with the story told in music and song and also in a dance pantomime. As you see, the dancers wear hideous but uh, very beautifully made masks and costumes. Oh. <laughs> this entertainment always draws a large crowd. Most are there to see the dancers, but uh, some do attend for another purpose. Uh -huh. This is the only way courting couples can meet each other. And our couple is here. The handsome fellow in the center is Belan. And this is Romani, his fiancée. 
very much aware of Balan's presence. They've just uh, recently become engaged. This romance came about through the coconut, or uh, more properly through choir, the fiber made from the coconut. The fiber is spun into a yarn by the village girls, including Romani. As part of her duties, uh, Romani has to take uh, bundles of yarn to the choir factory. Uh, at first, this was just a pleasant relief from turning the spinning wheel, a, a chance to get away for a little while from the coconut plantation and uh, have a pleasant boat ride on one of the village rivers. Now, I'll bet I can guess what happened. She met Balan. She did. He works at the choir factory, and they became aware of each other and very much attracted to each other. So the uh, daily trip to the factory ceased to be a mildly pleasant chore and became a very romantic journey. difficult for Romani to always contrive some excuse for lingering at the factory and uh, letting Balan know that she was far from indifferent to him and also seeing that Balan was far from indifferent to her. Yes, there's no doubt about how they feel. Finally, this uh, silent, tentative courtship blossomed. Uh, Balan came home from work one day to find that his sister and mother had news for him. As with our Iranian hero, there's just three in this family. The uh, father is dead. No uncles? Ah, yes, a most important uncle, as you'll see. Balan's sister is unmarried, though she's uh, quite a beauty, isn't she? It may be that the son has to marry first. This is the mother. Balan is prepared for the usual casual chat with his mother, but she quickly brings the conversation around to marriage. Uh, she wants to see him settle with a wife. How old is he? He's 20. Not too young for marriage here. Oh, no. Balan learns that his mother has uh, picked out a girl for him and uh, this urges him to openly declare his feelings for Romani. His mother is delighted. Apparently, she was the personal choice of her husband. So, all is well. Here is the important uncle, Professor Jones, the old gentleman with the umbrella. Aha! I fancy he's about to approach the girl's family. Yes, he is. You know, the mother's brother is her proxy in such affairs. Though the mother is the real power, a man must make the formal contacts for her. Such red tape. It's also required that a friend of Balan's accompany the uncle. Now, that could be Ramani's uncle. No, it's her father. Uh, there is no uncle in this family, seemingly. As was the case in Iran, it's almost certain that Romani's parents know the purpose of the visit. I would think so. There's always some forewarning, open or by indirection. Aha, are we going to have another sugar bowl stunt? No, this will be quite straightforward. The uncle and the friends see the girl. They at least hint at their interest in a marriage. Those are special caste marks, aren't they? Yes, they denote the Izaba caste, a uh, Hindu caste. You see the uncle stare? He's watching uh, Romani's approach to uh, judge her appearance, to see if she's free of deformity. He speaks to her to hear her uh, quality of speech. Poor Romani. She's paraded like a show horse. I thought this was a woman's world. Well, it is. It's really Balan's mother who will pass judgment on the girl, on the basis of the uncle's report. 
Again, a proud mother exhibits her daughter's skill with cloth and needle. That's a very characteristic gesture, that tossing of the head. It signifies polite agreement and appreciation. I see. So this visit ends. There'll be others as the families come to agreement. The high point in the courtship for Romani and Balan comes when they have their only direct meeting prior to marriage. Their one chance to be together, and it's a very brief encounter. You know, with the exception of the Canadian situation, I'm beginning to think the whole purpose of courtship is to keep the young people apart and not bring them together. <laughs> Well, they'll manage, Miss Don't, as they do everywhere. I suppose so. Romani makes her entrance in sound feminine fashion only after her mother has greeted Balan and the friend who comes with him. At this visit, the girl's parents get a chance to uh, personally appraise the suitor. Do you see how she gets rid of the father? He hasn't any voice in this whole affair. The mother is completely in charge. Of course, if she had a brother, he would likely be present. On a pretext, the mother leaves so the young people can be alone. The uh, boisterous friend tries to relax the somewhat tense Balan by joking with him. Last minute primping by Romani, and then the mother brings a tray of betel nut for the girl to serve the boys. And here's the big moment. Romani is very coy and bashful in this encounter. Balan seems speechless. Uh, the friend has to carry the conversation. Romani is so confused by the friend's sallies that she immediately flees. Now the climax of the courtship. The village astrologer has to cast the horoscope of the young Romani and Balan to determine if their marriage would be auspicious. Is this serious, or is it just a social gesture? Oh, very serious. Uh, astrology is very much believed in by all Hindus. For every family event from birth to death, he's consulted. Now, could he decide that the couple shouldn't marry at all? Yes, he could, as far as I know. And they'd probably accept his findings completely. You'll notice no uh, women attend this ceremony, only the men. The father is permitted to attend here. I'd say the things are going very well. Yes, everything seems in order, and the astrologer can tie a symbolic knot showing that the marriage would be an auspicious one. Well, that brings us up to date on a Kerala courtship and uh, also back to the evening dance. Our young people pretend to look at fiercely grimacing dancers, but uh, really look at each other. Romani and Balan can't meet even though they're engaged? No, no meetings until they're married, with or without a chaperone, except at the evening entertainments and at a distance. Courtship in Kerala. How did you like it? Absolutely charming. In fact, I think all the situations have been fascinating. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, and, uh, and how similar. Uh, despite the superficial differences, the basic fact is for the same. You mean boy meets girl. Boy gets girl, I should say. Well, in those situations, yes. But uh, I suppose it could be otherwise. But I was thinking of the fundamental similarity that uh, each society imposes its own will on the individual. Even though the patterns of courtship uh, differ, mm -hmm. nevertheless, each milieu sees to it that the people conform to those patterns. But this pressure comes from society and family rather than through some legal process. Yes, mainly, although um, marriage law is involved in many societies to some extent. Well, now, I think, remember, you saying earlier that all these patterns and customs that we've been talking about are changing in, in most countries. Yes. Uh, well, you get social change in every country, I suppose. The, the rate of change uh, varies. But uh, particularly in, um, in societies that are becoming in industrialized, the rate of change is uh, very rapid. And uh, you'd naturally expect courtship patterns to change. Why, uh, why naturally? Well, uh, as a society becomes industrialized, its uh, production patterns and so on change. Uh, people, uh, the patterns of working are different, and we find that family structures change. Mm -hmm. What happens is that uh, sons and daughters go out to work in uh, factories and in offices. Aha, the emancipation of women. <laughs> yes, and the em emancipation of sons, too. <laughs> uh, because uh, what happens is that the sons and daughters start earning money, have salaries of their own, and they uh, uh, become independent of the family in this way, and, and, and gradually become, uh, are able to make decisions on their own, adopt new attitudes, and gradually, the traditional forms change. But this hadn't happened with our hero in Iran, as far as we could tell. No, but we did see change, in the, uh, changes taking place in, the, in that situation. And I think probably the rate of social change hasn't reached its full force in Iran yet. Well, now, let's talk about the uh, differences rather than the similarities. Uh, it seemed to me the most pronounced difference was the matter of who controls the courtship. Yes, well, which really means who controls the marriage. Yes. Or put another way, the free choice versus the arranged uh, marriage. And it seemed to me that this uh, was a marked difference between the Western examples and the Eastern examples, which we've seen. Yeah. You know, these, these arranged marriages, they seem to me so businesslike and unromantic. I mean, surely people should be allowed to make a selection of a mate for themselves on whatever basis they choose, and preferably on love. Yes, but uh, the arranged marriage doesn't necessarily preclude love. There are a number of societies which believe that marriage should come first and love follow. Is that always true? No, of course not. But uh, can we say that uh, arranged marriages founder more frequently than our free choice uh, marriages? Uh, look at our divorce rates. Well, our divorce rates are high because we allow divorce. Yes, but that's part of the free choice pattern, isn't it? Yes, and maybe we have to have divorce because we do uh, put such a, an emphasis on romantic love. Because in a sense, it's not the most efficient way of choosing a mate. I believe there are societies where uh, marrying for love is, uh, is quite frowned on. Well, there certainly are. There are societies where the uh, relationship between a father and his son, or um, a mother and a daughter, are much more important than the relationship between a husband and wife. I think that's carrying tradition too far. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, and, and certainly different from us at any rate. Um, but at the same time, I think it uh, should cause us to uh, wonder whether we don't put too much of an emphasis on romantic love in our society. I wish we could uh, pursue this point and many others, Miss Dunn, Professor Jones, but we've exhausted our time, if not our ideas. Thank you both for sharing this comparison. And I still say, vive l'amour. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll hear the last word. Yeah.